Okay, here we go. Good evening. I'm Toby Katz, and on behalf of the Sisterhood of Temple Israel of Great Nick, welcome to our ongoing lecture series on Zoom. Tonight's topic is the enduring legacy of Fiddler on the Roof. Okay. Okay, well. This year marks the 50th anniversary of the film's release and our special guest, Barbara Eisenberg, whom you see here on the screen, as I admit another participant. Okay. We'll discuss the making of the film version of the Broadway play and why after half a century, this musical still has universal worldwide appeal. Fiddler on the Roof is a musical. The musical is a uniquely American art form. Western opera originated in Europe and was originally intended to recreate ancient Greek drama or what Europeans thought was ancient Greek drama. A few operas were comedies such as The Barber of Seville. Most were serious, even tragic stories such as Lucia de Lamamor or La Boheme or La Traviata. Verdi's Nabucco about the Babylonian exile of the Jews from Judah was actually written to start a revolution in Italy and it did. Operettas such as the works of Gilbert and Sullivan were also European inventions. The musical was born in the USA. In 1963, the producers of Fiddler on the Roof held a backers audition to raise money to mount the show on Broadway. Potential investors were invited to a room where they heard the music and the lyrics, were introduced to the storyline, may have seen pictures of the sets and the costumes, and were encouraged to put up the money to back the show, basically to invest with the hope of getting a return on their investment. And obviously those initial investors did get a nice return on their investment. At the end of the evening, some of these potential investors asked, what, what kind of a musical is this? The first act ends with a pogrom, and the second act ends with an expulsion. By definition, a musical is not necessarily a comedy. Many of the great American musicals dealt with very, very serious subjects. Showboat and South Pacific dealt with racism. West Side Story, which was a New York version of Romeo and Juliet, dealt with ethnic conflicts and ended with a murder. Annie Getter Bunn dealt with feminism and the equality of women. And Fiddler on the Roof has as a secondary theme, anti-Semitism. Let's get started. Our special guest, Barbara Eisenberg, is an award-winning journalist and author whose special area of interest is the arts. In her career spanning more than three decades, she has been a staff reporter for the Wall Street Journal and for the Los Angeles Times, where she remains a frequent contributor. She is the author of several books, including the bestseller Conversations with Architect Frank Gehry, who was born Frank Goldberg, and tonight's topic, and let's take a look at the book. Just want to enlarge this. Okay. The title of Barbara's book that she's going to discuss tonight is Tradition, the highly improbable, ultimately triumphant Broadway to Hollywood story of Fiddler on the Roof, the world's most beloved musical. In her book, I'm sorry, I can't get this whole thing on the screen. 
In her book, Barbara explores Fiddler's legacy and cultural significance as it resonates with audiences around the world, and it still is, by the way. Barbara will share some anecdotes about the making of the film and how it translated Shalom Aleichem's Tevye stories into a big screen musical. She'll discuss the reasons for its timeless international appeal and why audiences from Argentina to India to Japan so strongly identify with a 19th century Yiddish speaking Russian Jew from Anatevka. Before I turn the program over to Barbara Eisenberg, okay, screen sharing has stopped, okay. Okay, before I turn the program over to Barbara, let's begin with the overture. All musicals begin with an overture. It previews the musical numbers in the show and gets the, sets the mood for the audience. Here, performing the overture to Fiddler on the Roof is violin virtuoso Itzcock Perlman and the London Philharmonic. And let's take a look at this. Thank you. 
Okay, Barbara, it's all yours. Well, thank you. That was actually Gustavo Dudamel, the uh, head of the Los Angeles Philharmonic, who was obviously making a special visit to your temple. <laughs> but thank you so much, Toby, for inviting me here today. It's my great pleasure to be here. And I want to thank also Shalom Aleichem, the man who first introduced us to Anna Tefka and to Tevye more than a hundred years ago. But the fiddler on the roof that we all know today, and which just celebrated its 58th anniversary in September, didn't take shape until the 1960s. That's when a friend sent the lyricist Sheldon Harnick a copy of an Alehem novel called Wandering Stars, with the notion it might make a good musical. Harnick loved it, and so did his frequent collaborator, the composer Jerry Bach. The two men, who were very prominent at the time as a songwriting duo, had written the score for the Tony-winning musical Fiorello and were looking for a new project. So Bach and Harnick took the idea to playwright Joseph Stein with whom they had worked on an earlier musical, but Stein was not impressed. He liked the idea of adapting Alehem, but he was more taken with the Alehem stories of Tevya and his family, which his Poland-born father had read to him in Yiddish when he was a boy, and which he thought had better odds as a musical. It took him a while to find English copies of those stories, but once he found them and got them to Bach and to Harnick, they were also convinced. Now, as most of us know now, Sholem Aleyhem's stories pivot around the worries and wisdom of Dairyman Tevye in a poor Russian village or shtetl, where he is blessed with a skeptical wife and many daughters to marry off. In the closing years of Tsarist Russia, Amid pogroms and poverty, the irrepressible Bible quoting Tevye deals with the untraditional courtships of his children, as well as the political and social changes that threaten his beliefs, his community, and his traditions. Now, now Sheldon Bach, I'm sorry, <laughs> Jerry Bach, Sheldon Harnick, and Mr. Stein all said that the more they read the stories, the more excited they got. We decided to have a go at it, composer Bach told me. I still remember his exact words. He said, quote, I am not being modest. We had no idea what would happen to this project. We'll do this show, and if it worked out, we do another show. So Joe Stein worked at turning 19th century stories written in Yiddish into something relevant to an English speaking 20th century theater audience. His goal, he has said, was to remain true to the spirit and feeling of Sholem Aleichem and to tell the story of Tevya, his family and his community in terms which would have meaning for today. Composer Bach, in turn, said, quote, I began to hear the music as I read the stories and remembered the lullabies and the little melodies that my grandmother would sing to me when I was a child. 
it was almost as if I recognized and knew these people spiritually. For all of us, the people in the stories brought back early members of our own families, and we felt confident about plunging into the material. Now, the first song that they worked on was for Tevye's dream, a dream that the patriarch creates to persuade his wife, Golda, to let their eldest daughter, Seidel, marry the poor tailor who she loves, rather than the rich butcher who she does not love. It was a song they felt would stay in the show for plot purposes, no matter what changes Joe Stein made to the script. Now the dream song did remain in the show, but the next two songs, I'll Work for Tomorrow Today and A Butcher's Soul, did not remain. Their fourth song, it began when Harnick received a tape of music that Jerry Bach admitted was, quote, unashamedly sentimental. So I guess you know what's coming. It was the music for Sunrise Sunset. And remembered lyric, lyricist Harnick that as he listened to it, the words just crystallized automatically. Jerry Bach lived in New Rochelle, and when the two men finished writing, they called his wife down to the basement where they worked, and they played it for her on the piano. And then a while later, when Harnick went to Bethesda, Maryland, and played it for his sister, she cried, just like uh, the uh, like Jerry's wife had cried in the basement. Everybody was crying, and Harnick thought, "We have something here." But it took a while to convince the producer. The authors turned first to Harold Prince, who they had all worked with before and respected. Yet even Prince turned them down initially. So did all other producers, one of them even asking what they would do when they ran out of Hadassah benefits. Now, Prince did give them some very smart advice, however. He said, get Jerome Robbins. Not only had the choreographer and director Robbins already triumphed on Broadway with Gypsy and with West Side Story, but he also came from a Russian Jewish background, just like Prince did. It wasn't right for Robbins either at first. He was too busy with other projects, but eventually he came back and so did Prince. The authors had written almost a complete show when Robbins came in, but everything changed with the arrival of their new collaborator. When Robbins began to shape and stage the show, they did what composers, lyricists, and librettists have always done. They rewrote. People always say that musicals are not written, they are rewritten. Stein turned out five drafts of the show's book, and the songwriters came up with about 50 songs, of which the show used fewer than one third. Most importantly, Jerome Robbins guided Bach, Harnick, and Stein as the four men turned what producer Prince called, quote, a simple folk tale, close quote, into an American classic. Consider, for instance, the show's opening scene before Jerome Robbins entered the picture. The show originally opened in the kitchen with a song called, quote, We've Never Missed a Sabbath Yet, which Matriar Goldie, Golda sang with her daughters. Among its lyrics were cautions about getting noodles made, chickens plucked, liver chopped, and challah baked in time to light and bless the Sabbath candles. But that song did not promise audiences the show that Robbins had in mind. Harnick said Robbins acted like a district attorney coming back to his authors again and again. 
when he would ask, what is this show about? And we'd say, well, it's about this dairy man who had a lot of daughters. He'd say, no, 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 that's not what the show is about. If that's what the show is about, it's the forerunner of the Goldbergs. It's warm and it's funny, but it doesn't have the power that the Elaham stories have. Where is that power coming from? In fact, Robbins asked them so many times until finally one day, Sheldon Harnick finally said, it's about tradition. And Robbins replied, that's it, right back. Now, as we all know, the theme of tradition today weaves through scene after scene of the musical, starting with its powerful opening scene and song, Tradition. Now, for producer Prince, tradition changed everything. Quote, it seems to me that aside from the brilliantly metaphorical staging that Jerome Robbins gave the entire show, his main contribution was nagging the authors for a reason behind the musical, said Prince. That opening number accounts for the show crossing ethnic and religious lines and becoming a huge success. Now, getting one of Broadway's most formidable performers to inhabit Teviot didn't hurt. It took a while to convince Zero Mostel to play the part but that they did. While Mostel often sprinkled a little too much stick over his performances, sometimes he would even squeeze Tevye's wet rags over the orchestra pit, and all of the musicians would run for cover to hide their, all of their music so it wouldn't get all wet, and to hide their instruments so they would, excuse me, wouldn't get wet. Or he would joke with an audience member in the front row, Yet Mostel was clearly a comic genius. So with Mostel leading their cast, the creative team rehearsed in New York and in the summer of 1964 traveled first to Detroit and then to Washington, D.C., shedding lines and songs that didn't work, adding new ones that did work, and testing it all on theater goers. Now, reviews were not too good at the beginning. In Detroit, for instance, where there was a newspaper strike, Variety had the only first night review. And aside from Mostel, the review disparaged everything and everyone else. Austin Pendleton, who created the role of Merkel, the tailor on stage, remembers that the show's first review in Detroit, there were just four or five paragraphs, and it was totally dismissive, and everybody was depressed. The night of the review, they all headed to the bar across the street, and everyone was at tables drinking except for Jerry Robbins, who was standing alone at the bar. So Austin Pendleton went over to him and he said, what are you going to do? And Robin said, 10 things a day. And that's what he did. All the time in Detroit and in Washington, he kept cutting and heightening and shaping it. Now in Washington, Bach and Harnett came up with the wonderful miracle of miracles. And Jerome Robbins came up with one of the theater's most enduring dances, the Russian bottle dance. And it was in Detroit where Harnick also wrote the show's poignant song, Do You Love Me? So I'm going to read to you a little bit about that song from my book, Tradition. Harnick concentrated hard on completing a song that he'd been thinking about for weeks during their rehearsals in New York. Said Harnick that it struck him, quote, it'd be very funny if there were a song that started with Tevia saying to Goldie, do you love me? And her looking at him as though he were out of his mind and saying, do I what? But I had no idea where that song would go. When we got to Detroit, I started to take long walks thinking about what they would really say to each other. 
at the end of the first week, I was lucky if I had maybe 16 lines. By the end of the second week, I had enough to give it to Jerry Bach. Quote, we put the song Do Love Me into the show, and a few days later, I went to see it. When they sang the song, to my astonishment, I choked up. I thought, oh my God, I'm going to disturb the audience. I'm going to start sobbing. So I raced out of the theater, asking myself what was going on. And then I realized, oh my God, I have written what I wished the relationship was between my own parents who fought so much. And now I'm going to put Fiddler in context for you. So you have to remember there were not a lot of shows like Fiddler on the Roof when they started writing it in 1961, much less when it opened on Broadway in 1964. That was the year that the Beatles debuted on the Ed Sullivan show, My Fair Lady and Mary Poppins were hit movies, and both Hello Dolly and Funny Girl were already faring well on Broadway when Fiddler premiered in September. It was also a pivotal time in world history, with the Holocaust only two decades before. Much as the Diary of Anne Frank is not just a Jewish story, neither is Fiddler on the Roof. Fiddler's strong themes of family, tradition, prejudice, immigration, emigration, and conflict between generations continue to evoke common ground for the audience, wherever they are. Glenn Casal, a Sacramento, California director who has now directed several productions, productions of Fiddler over the years, would always tell his actors to turn on the television and watch what country was experiencing heartbreak right then. He said every time that he turned on Fiddler on any, well, every time he turned on television, that happened. But every time he directed Fiddler on the Roof, it would coincide with something going on in the world. People losing their rights and losing their homes. That's what made it timeless. Yet Fiddler did not open on Broadway as a sure fire hit. On September 22nd, 1964, after Fiddler's long-awaited Broadway opening, invited guests gathered at New York's swank Rainbow Room in New York to celebrate. The first review that came in that night was from critic Walter Kerr, and it wasn't very good. But producer Harold Prince read it aloud to his guests anyway. I can't resist reading this to you, he said that night, because it's so irrelevant. Apparently so. Nearly eight years and 3,300 performances later, Fiddler became the longest running show on Broadway. Rarely off stage, rarely on hiatus, Fiddler on the Roof was just back on Broadway a few years ago for its fifth revival. It played London's West End four times and remains among Broadway's 16 longest running shows ever. There have now been stage productions all over the world, including 15 in Finland alone, as well as in thousands of schools, community centers, and regional theaters. Now, Norman Jewison's 1971 film of the same name has had similar longevity. The United Artists film received eight Academy Award nominations, including Best Picture. It has a score arranged by John Williams, which won the renowned composer his very first Oscar. And the music for its opening credits was played by Isaac Stern, the most famous violinist of his time. Oh, and as an aside, when they find, when Norman Jewison the director convinced Isaac Stern to play the, the violin solos. The first thing that Stern asked him was, do I have to stand on the roof? 
So production designer Robert Boyle created 1905 Anatevka in the villages of Yugoslavia, while the cinematographer shot through women's stockings to get the film's earthen colors and textures. Director Jewison, who had stood in snow up to his knees when he was scouting locations a year earlier, never encountered any snow at all during the entire filming. It was all marble dust, not snow in that movie. Topol's Tevia talked to a god that was in actuality a piece of white cardboard with a Jewish star on it. It was attached to a stick on the camera. And then he was told to always look at that star so that Topol would always look for his god in the same place. The film that critic Pauline Kael once called, quote, the most powerful movie musical ever made has already been seen by one billion people. People always want to see Fiddler, and that means people pretty much everywhere, from the UK to Argentina, to Senegal and to India. Theaters in perhaps 120 countries have now created Anatevka on stage, and it is probably easier to name the ones that have not played it. Fiddler is also the most popular American musical to play Japan, and librettist Joe Stein liked to talk about his experience when he went to Japan for the show's very first Asian production. The Japanese producer asked him, do they understand this show in America? Stein said. And when I replied, why do you ask? The producer said, because it's so Japanese. And now, uh, before we start the, the questions and answers, I'd like to show you a great example of how Fiddler speaks to all generations and cultures. Here's a short video taken at the wedding reception of Lin-Manuel Miranda, who you may know as the young Latino playwright, actor, and rapper who wrote and created Hamilton, who also happens to be a great fan of Fiddler. Please cue the video. Uh, ba Barbara, I'm having a slight problem, so give me it's not a, so you're going to have to give me one second okay lord have mercy okay i just have to do you want me to talk about something so to distract people uh well no okay <laughs> i'm going to have to i'm going to try to i'm going to try to minimize the screen and I seem to be having a problem doing this. So let's let's see what we can do. No, I, I had it opened and for some reason it closed. So. Okay. Okay, give me a second. Okay, we're gonna open it up. Don't anyone leave. This is a wonderful video. Uh, no, no, don't any don't, don't anybody go away. Okay. Okay, we're ready now. Here we go. Okay, on mark, get set, go. I gotta back it up. You talk among yourselves. Well, let's just say, look at the screen while she's backing it up. It's it's called Vanessa and Lynn Manuel, 
a wedding surprise. Okay. And um, do you hear it? I want to thank you yeah. all for being here. All your all do our you friends hear and family. It? Yes. And okay. I know Lynn, you're not expecting this, but I think you can help me toast all our friends and family. So please come up and join me. Come on, don't be shy. You've been here before. You've been here before. <laughs> oh, how should I start? Well, we all want money, so here's to our prosperity. To our health and happiness. And most importantly, to life, to life, la haim, la haim, la haim, to life. Here's to the father I try to be. Here's to my bride to be. Drink la haim, to life, to life, la haim, la haim, la haim, life. Life has a way of confusing us, blessing and bruising us. Drink la haim to life. God would like us to be joyful even when our hearts lie panting on the floor. How much more can we be joyful when there's really something to be joyful for? To life, to life, la haim. Vanessa, my daughter. My wife! Something to think about. Something to drink about. Drink la haim. Red Sarah, drinks for everyone! What's the occasion? I'm get, picking myself a bride! Who's it to be? Frank's daughter, Vanessa! Mazel tov! To Lynn Manuel, to Frankie! Vanessa, your daughter! My wife! May all your futures be pleasant ones, my time are present ones! Drink La Haim to life, to life, La Haim! La Haim, La Haim to life! It takes a wedding to make a sale. Let's live on another day. Drink the high to life. It's a glass and sip a drop of shops in the drink. Good luck that favors you. We know that when good fortune favors two such men, it stands for reason. We deserve it too.
Good work, Toby. That was wonderful. Well, I didn't do it. You gave it to me. This was wonderful. <laughs> but th this shows the universal appeal, the absolute universal appeal. Barbara, this was fabulous. This oh, was you. fabulous, absolutely fabulous. And um, what I'm gonna ask all of you, if anyone has a question, we're gonna ask you, put, put your cursor down toward the bottom and you're gonna see the word participants. If you click on participants, find your name and unmute self. Let me see if I can, un um, okay. You can unmute yourself, which is basically you click on the little picture of a microphone next to your name. And if you have any questions for Barbara. Okay, why don't we do it this way? Why don't we do it this way? I'm gonna put everybody on view. Okay. We're going to view everybody. If you have a question, raise your hand. Oh, we have a hand up. Linda Emanuel. Okay, let me unmute you. You'll have to, okay. Linda, find, click on participants on the bottom of your screen. Click on participants and you'll see your name and, oh, you're unmuted. Okay, go ahead. Hi, um, I very much enjoyed your presentation. I'm familiar. Um, I would like to hear your comments about what I think is the latest version, which was done in Yiddish um, with Joel Gray. Do you want to speak about that at all? Well, unfortunately, I was never in New York the same time it was on. I was there before it played and I was back after it played. Did you see it? No, I read a review about it, um, which said that it was absolutely fantastic. The review by Jesse Green, by the way, who happens to be family. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think a lot of people liked it, you know, and I can remember Jesse Green's review of it too. And I imagine that it will go around the country at some point, you know, that it will travel uh, and then come back to New York. I think it's closed now, isn't it? Yes. No. Yes. Is any, did anyone else see it and want to talk about it? I see a hand. Oh, Karen. Yeah. yeah. Karen, you want to unmute yourself? Karen, can you unmute yourself? Click on participants, find your name, and click on the microphone icon. I think we got you now. Say something. Well, you can unclick her, Toby. Uh, no, I can't. Her. Unfortunately, I don't think I can. Let me try. There we are, I think. Oh, yeah. yes, you did it. Victory, okay. Victory, okay. victory over technology. Thank you. Um, and thanks, Susan Jeralem, for sending me the link and uh, including me. It's wonderful, wonderful. Um, and I really have a deeply personal connection in that my mom, uh, who was a dancer in the new dance group and uh, in the Yiddish theater, all the way through some fairly significant Broadway shows, Zichronon um, Libraha. But she would talk about working in the Yiddish theater with both Zero Mustel and Jack Wugman and other um, who were not yet great, but then went on. And yes, I, I think I saw the original Fiddler with Zero probably five times. And the movie and Herschel Bernardi and Topol um, and I did see the last production, uh, which in some ways was more powerful than ever. It was sparse. It was more Bertolt Brechtian in the production. 
and the political socio um, uh, message about anti-Semitism and racism and xenophobia was just so poignant. Uh, it was beautiful. And your insights now kind of behind the, the stage and the creation really added another wonderful depth. So thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you for sharing about it. Does anybody else have any questions or comments, questions? Okay, I have a quick one and then I wanna tell you about our next program. Barbara, the, I, I, I don't have words to describe how wonderful this was. This was absolutely wonderful. Um, just a, a comment, my maternal grandparents came from Lithuania in a town called, um, Gelvan, which is outside of Vilna. And my grandfather saw the play. And when the movie opened, my parents took him to see the movie. And he was shocked out of his mind because he's when the opening scene in the marketplace and everything, he said, that's exactly how my town looked. And he was born in 1880. And he said, how did the movie recreate my town? It, it, it's like so it, it's 80 almost 80 years later how did they do it well they did it the same way that they recreate rome and everything else on the screen you know they do great research and then they bring in very clever designers and people who do construction now on this film norman jewison went all over europe he went to israel he thought it'd be great to have it in israel he couldn't find anything in Israel, except he did bring back with him the um, construction, uh, uh, what do you call it, the blueprint for, for a small temple he saw in Israel, because he thought, I might need this. He brought it back with him. He couldn't get permission to do it in Russia, so he kept traveling through uh, Europe until he finally got to Yugoslavia. And then they looked, they had been looking at villages everywhere from Austria to Hungary and Romania. And then all he had to do, well, not all, but one of the main things he had to do in uh, Yugoslavia was to remove all the telephone poles, just temporarily. They were all taken away. And um, then he tried to had give it the quality of the Chagall paintings. And if any of you know the paintings of Chagall, um, the show was designed around the colors of Chagall. And in fact, Jerome Robbins asked Chagall how he felt about doing the design for the, for the musical. And Chagall was very polite, but said he was too busy. <laughs> and then they tried to create that Chagall-like picture on its own and um the uh they they used three different yugoslavian villages that were sort of near zagreb and uh they had taken various photographs and sketches of things about the same time and so they used all three towns or villages really to recreate uh anatevka which is a fake it's not a real place, Anatevka, to create a place like you would imagine Anatevka. One of the three towns, the buildings were so old in this town in Yugoslavia that they didn't have to do much. In another town, the buildings were so old, but they were made of the same kind of wood that Yugoslavia would have had at, at that time. So they used some of that wood to make changes. And then in one of the towns, it looked so old that they recreated the marketplace so accurately that one day a peasant in the neighborhood came into the marketplace and tried to buy a horse. <laughs> so, and, and then, oh, and the new synagogue, they created a new synagogue, they created an actual a house for Tevia. That's a good, that's a good answer. That's enough answer. 
Barbara, th this again, thank you. This was so fantastic. It was wonderful. I'd like to take the remaining two minutes, if I may, to preview our next program. Sunrise, sunset was the answer to that question. Okay. Okay. Our next program is going to be on Monday, March 21st at 7 p.m. on Zoom. I'm trying to get rid of this. Okay, our next program is going to be Monday, March 21st on Zoom. The title is Extremism in Ancient Judea and the Threat to American Democracy. How easily a deeply polarized and divided country can destroy itself from within a cautionary tale. And we're honored to have as our guest speaker, Professor Lawrence Schiffman of New York University. Some of you may recognize his name as being one of the first people to translate the Dead Sea Scrolls when they were first uncovered. It's Monday, March 20th at, on Zoom. And we have a special thanks to Rabbi Maram Cherry for recommending Rabbi, uh, Professor Schiffman and for, and for actually introducing him to us and getting him to agree to do this. I hope you can all join us. Monday, March 21st at 7 p.m. Barbara, thank you so much. Barbara, where'd you go? Oh, I just closed it. Wait, I'll open it again. I'm right here. <laughs> okay, Barbara, thank you again. This has been absolutely fabulous. And we, uh, I'll send you the link to the recording of this. Good, thank you. And you can share it with you know whomever you like. And those of you who missed it, it's on our Temple Israel YouTube page if you want to see it again. And Barbara, I hope you can join us. I'm going to see if I can. Um, well, here you, you see the, the book cover. Barbara's book is Tradition, the highly improbable, ultimately triumphant Broadway to, uh, to Hollywood story of Fiddler on the Roof. And it's a it's in it's in print now, yes. Yes. It's yes. In, it's it's actually it's been in paperback now, so you can oh. buy it on from Amazon in paperback, and you can buy uh, you can buy it as an audio book, and you and the person reading the book is Adam Grouper, who was in the uh, Broadway version of Fiddler, and he's very good. He can play every voice in the play. Okay, that is good. Thank, thank you, Barbara. Thank everybody for joining us. And we hope to see you again on March 21st. Thank you so much. Have a pleasant evening. I'm going to end the recording now.